1998. He revolutionized animal sheltering by housing dogs and cats awaiting adoption in cozy settings rather than cages, setting a new standard for sheltering practices now widely emulated around the country. So welcome, Mr. Alexino. And Jane Hoffman, sorry, I'll introduce both of you. <laughs> Jane Hoffman helped found the Mayor's Alliance for New York City's Animals, the Alliance, in 2002, and has served as president ever since. The Alliance was created with work with the City of New York to apply creative, targeted solutions to New York City's homeless animal crisis. And she's been working pursuant to a 10-year strategic plan with over 150 rescue groups and shelters that now participate in the Alliance, ranging from the ASPCA, a founding member, to small neighborhood-based rescue groups, and the Alliance has been very successful in reducing euthanasia. Ms. Hoffman is an attorney, formerly in private practice, specializing in taxation, executive compensation, and estate planning. Um, in addition to her commitment to the Alliance, she's this also... Is a <laughs> She's also a founding member and former secretary and chair of the New York City Bar Association's Animal Law Committee, um, the first of its kind in the U.S. And in 2007, she received the inaugural excellence uh, in the Advancement of Animal Law Award from the ABA Tips Committee. And she continues to speak around the country, and we're so lucky to have her with us. So please join me in giving a warm welcome. Good morning, and thank you, gentlemen. Um, I, I got about a two-minute introduction. It's really to bring Jane Hoffman up here to talk to you about what's really going on. Uh, but I'm going to, having also graduated from law school, passed the bar and all that kind of stuff, I, once I get the microphone, it's hard to get away from it. <laughs> so uh, let me just tell you about uh, the bad old days. Uh, when I came to the movement, uh, Back in 1976, um, I came with a variety of different experiences. I was a pharmacist and a practicing attorney. I had been uh, uh, worked at the Legislative Council working for the California Legislature drafting health care laws. I um, became a lobbyist for the health care industry. I was hired by the federal government to do health care planning for eventual national health insurance. And from there, I went to work for the biggest cat house in San Francisco. <laughs> I sold love for a living, and I loved every minute of it, and I never really got arrested. Um, so um, we started from a rather tough uh, start. Uh, the country at the time that I came to the movement uh, was killing about 24 million dogs and cats nationwide. In San Francisco, uh, we were euthanizing about 35,000 dogs and cats. Um, back in the day, the most humane way considered by shelter practitioners to end the life of our best friends on four legs was to use what was called a decompression chamber. Um, the way we did uh, birth control was to basically euthanize all females. No, no female dogs or cats were adopted. Uh, the veterinary community had not yet embraced spay and neuter, and uh, almost no shelters in the country were providing spay and neuter of any kind whatsoever. The adoption hours in San Francisco was from 11 o'clock in the morning until 4 o'clock in the afternoon and closed on the weekends. The, the theory being that nobody that was um, working should have a companion animal because they couldn't be there to provide ongoing care and it's better dead than uh, left in inadequate uh, situation. Uh, the litany was uh, too many animals, not enough homes, and it's not our fault, it's irresponsible caregivers, and therefore animals die. Fortunately, uh, our movement has progressed. Uh, today, our country is killing about three million dogs and cats. Uh, most of them are the old and the ugly, the injured and the ill, and the poorly behaved. Uh, I'm particularly devoted to finding homes for the old and the ugly, the injured and the ill, and the poorly behaved. And I'm not talking about shelter workers, I'm talking about companion <laughs> animals in shelters and with rescues. So uh, while we've reduced euthanasia uh, countrywide and also reduced those numbers in San Francisco, 
Um, we haven't yet found homes for them all. And uh, as Jack was saying in the introduction, Maddie's Fund believes that we could have a no-kill nation by 2015. That's not too far away, by the way. A lot of people think that this, this kind of philosophy harkens back to the day when I used to be the biggest pot grower in San Francisco. Um, actually, I never took marijuana, but, but yeah, it was like, in the nail. So, yeah, but now, no, I, uh, so anyway, uh, we, we have 17 million people that are going to adopt a pet uh, this year, and they haven't decided where they're going to get their next companion animal. And we have to convince less than 3 million of those uh, to go to a shelter or a rescue to find a loving home. Uh, that's about 15% of the people who haven't yet decided where to go need to go to an animal shelter, and we will have a no-kill nation, a country that can guarantees our family members on four legs a loving home. So uh, let me talk a little bit about the San Francisco experience. Um, when I came to the cause, um, like, like I said, we believed in the litany. Uh, we believed too many animals, not enough homes. We believed it was irresponsible caregivers. That was the reason why animals had to die. And it wasn't our fault. It was uh, a, a sign of the times. And um, it couldn't be done any other way. We were killing 90% of the companion animals at the time in our shelter. And our coworkers uh, didn't want to do it, but they accepted the fact that that's the way it had to be done. So we, we were also nine days away from bankruptcy when I had been hired. Um, <laughs> Well, welcome to the new world. And uh, so we had a, a, a few things to go about changing. One of the things we did was we started a spay neuter clinic and we started uh, fixing the ferals citywide. We also, I'm a uh, former attorney, I gave up my bar license, uh, but back in the day I had a personal goal of <coughs> suing or being sued every six weeks. <laughs> um, since I never really practiced law, that you know that was my substitute. You know, that I had to sue or be sued every six weeks. And one of the ways was to basically steal free roaming cats. So I had a bunch of uh, senior citizens that I would pay ten dollars to go out and find animals that were intact to bring them back to the SPCA so we could castrate them. And I would give out my business card to everybody and say, when you take the cat back to this neighborhood, if you find out who says that they're the owner, would you tell them that the SPCA illegally fixed your cat? He's been castrated. He's a little lighter than he was when he was growing before. And now uh, we've, got a, we've got a lawsuit here because this is clearly illegal. It's one of my huge disappointments. I never got sued. This is more than 20 years and never once got sued. But it was a wonderful platform to try to basically talk about the problems of free roaming animals, impact animals, and the importance of, of desexing. So we, we started all sorts of programs to try to get the word out about saving companion animal lives. And um, one of the programs we started associated with uh, stealing cats was also paying uh, to uh, fix all the bully dogs. And I started this program and I told the, my uh, public relations department that I wanted to name it Bucks for Bulls. <laughs> and uh, I, I thought it was a catchy way of trying to get everybody's attention. Uh, it was the only sexual harassment complaint I ever got from my soldiers because my male counterparts uh, felt that I was being gender insensitive. <laughs> so they filed a petition with my office saying that um, Bucks for Balls was a little inappropriate and over the top. And I loved it and I continued to promote it. Uh, so we started the first pet behavior program. We started the first comprehensive medical care program uh, for the injured, ill, and poorly behaved. Uh, we started adoption programs, uh, mobile adoptions, uh, state accredited pet grooming college, doggy daycare. We started a lot of programs to teach people who wanted to get into the movement how they could make a living, make a lot of money, and help us with our cause. And then, as uh, Jacqueline talked about, we started the first uh, uh, non-cage environment uh, for companion animals. All of our dogs had their own television so they could watch Rin Tin Tin movies and um, uh, uh, the cats had videos of, of squirrels and birds playing in the park. Um, we called them the condos and doggy apartments. Each doggy apartment uh, was furnished to be a room in somebody's house. 
And the idea was, uh, this is the living room, this is the family room, you know, this is the bedroom, this is the kitchen, uh, this is the dining room, etc. So the dining room had china, of course, and elephant uh, seating. And uh, the dogs, some of them chewed it up, but some of them actually uh, got acquainted. And then, because we believed in trying to publicize what we did, we offered homeless people a chance to stay with our dogs overnight. Because the idea was we were rehoming these pets, and pets need companionship 24 hours a day, and homeless people were living on the streets, and it was pretty uh, cold and ugly, and come on in and stay with our shelter dogs. And the homeless people just went ballistic. How dare you put us in a kennel? I said, but you got to come down and see our homes. I mean, you know, these are 600 square feet housing units, uh, individual housing units uh, with televisions and beds and sofas and chairs and really elegant accommodation. But the biggest complaint came from our contributors who thought that the homeless people were going to give our dog fleas. So, so it, was a, it was an idea that I thought had traction. Uh, we kept the dog apartments and the kitty condos, uh, but we didn't get the homeless into our environment. By the way, the idea of publicity helped us change our um, place in society. When I came there, we were nine days away from uh, bankruptcy. We were not doing a very good job, and we thought if we changed, we needed to basically do a good job, tell people about it, and then ask for help. So when I left, me and my coworkers were achieving 11 media stories a day, 365 days out of the year. Um, and we had one out of every three households in San Francisco supporting the San Francisco SBC, which is a good market penetration for a not-for-profit charity, particularly in a very um, uh, gracious and open and uh, giving uh, community. San Francisco has a lot of important social causes, some wonderful work that's being done on a variety of different social issues, and yet we were the ones that had the one out of three house penetration. So we've been uh, given some credit uh, or some blame for starting the no-kill movement. And uh, we did that by reaching out to all the shelters in San Francisco and forming a partnership, forming a collaboration. And, um, in our movement, you know, there's 12,000 organizations um, that help us uh, as shelters or rescues. And uh, the reason why we have 12,000 is not everybody agrees the right way to do it. Some people believe it should all be spay and neuter. Other people believe it should all be education. Some people believe it should all be adoptions. And so we have a lot of different organizations with a lot of different philosophies of how to go about uh, doing our work. And some of these organizations um, and maybe this is just a California thing, but some of these organizations disagree with each other. <laughs> and so we used to have a thing called Bash and Trash, and we thought Bash and Trash was really counterproductive. In, in our state, the only way you get elected is to basically say how evil the other person is, which usually results in the person that's the least evil getting elected, uh, but only one out of three people vote in an election because they really get turned off by the process and really get turned off by the negativity. And we can't sc squander our resources on bashing and trashing each other. I don't care how bad the other people are in the other organizations. There is nothing that can stand in the way of saving a life. And so we sat down with our counterpart of the Animal Control Agency and, and tried to create what's called the Adoption Pact. And, you know, my, my counterpart um, used to work for me for five years, strong personality, extremely capable guy, but he was really obnoxious. Uh, and he had strong points of view. I was very easygoing. You know, I had no opinions. You know, I'm, I'm so pliable and malleable and all that sort of stuff. But seriously, you know, we both came with our luggage. We both came with our history. We both came with our difficulties. And there was nothing, nothing that was going to stand in the way of us working out our differences because dog and cat lives were at stake. And we realized it was a community-wide issue. At that point in time, we were a no-kill organization. Uh, we had dropped the animal control contract after 110 years because we thought we really couldn't do our work being uh, the uh, instrument of government, which had a different agenda uh, than the humane community in terms of, of life-saving. And so we started the adoption pact, we started collaboration, and we promoted something called transparency and accountability. 
We thought we needed to put the numbers out there so our community, our contributors, our politicians would all understand what it was about in terms of how, how far we'd come, where we were at, where we needed to go, and what progress we were making towards that. And we think we did a pretty good job as a community-wide effort in terms of trying to turn our life-saving uh, record around. Like I said, getting back to some of the lawsuits, um, <coughs> tried to sue or be sued. One of the first things we did was we sued the state of California, very easy <coughs> target, um, who had more lawyers than, than we did, um, to basically save what's called the Angel Island deer. We have a little island in the middle of our bay called Angel Island, and the deer uh, were suffering because there was a drought. So the state was going to go over and shoot most of them. And we said, no, that's really not a good idea. So uh, we sued them. And we were the first um, non-government agency to get a writ of mandamus against the state of California, the Department of Fish and Game, to allow us to basically save the Angel Island deer. And there's quite a story that goes along with it, but I want to jump to the next one, which is really my epiphany for the no-kill movement. Uh, it started the first uh, animal rights case uh, for a companion animal. And this is the story of a little dog named Sido. She came out to our lives in 1979. She was an 11-year-old dog, an old dog. Now old dogs are particularly uh, uh, equal uh, to uh, some of my concerns. Um, and her, her life started uh, about 11 years before and was adopted by a wonderful lady named Mary Murphy who left a will saying her dog should be killed and uh, buried with her. And that was because she didn't think that uh, Sido, who was very pampered, very spoiled, and very loved, would adapt to any other kind of a lifestyle other than she had as a recluse attorney. And she had a very close friend, uh, uh, Rebecca Well Smith, who was the executrix who wrote the will, who came to pick up Sido two days after she came to us, after Mary Murphy died. Mary Murphy committed suicide and left her dog in her, in her home. And when the authorities found her uh, carcass, uh, they found this wonderful little dog, and but she brought the dog to us. Uh, the the uh, medical examiner brought the dog to us. We were going to try to find her a home, and Rebecca said, no, I've got this will, and we've got to kill her. She said, no, 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 we don't do that. Uh, we believe every dog uh, deserves a chance. At that time, we were killing dogs, and we were killing cats, and in very, very large numbers, but we, were, we believed that every dog and cat deserved another chance. And... Um, Rebecca Wells Smith thought that she had a responsibility as the attorney to basically carry out the dictates of the will. So uh, she came to pick up the dog. We said, nah, that's not going to happen. <laughs> so she said, well, we'll sue you. So I was sued for conversion. Um, as the San Francisco SPCA was sued for conversion. I reached out to the legal community to ask for help, and four lawyers jumped up the chance to basically represent her. Pillsbury Madison Sutro, which at that time was a very, very large law firm in San Francisco, decided they would represent San Francisco SPCA, and nobody represented me and my wife and my kids, you know. <laughs> but I didn't take it personally, uh, because this was really all about Sido. But uh, we tried to get a, a, a declaratory relief for Sido by asking if we could go to the court and just get the will rewritten with no adversarial relationship. And uh, Rebecca would have none of that. So... Um, we said, okay, if you're going to file the papers, go for it. And then I went to a newspaper in San Francisco called The Chronicle, which is a, a <laughs> daily, daily coverage. And I said, I got a possible story about this dog that's going to be killed. So the reporter comes over and he says, look, you guys are, the country's killing 24 million dogs and cats. You guys are killing a ton of dogs and cats. Um, what's all this about a single dog? And Sido, who was asleep at, at my feet at the time, she gets up, she goes over, she rubs up against the guy's leg, she puts her paw on his knee <laughs> and licks the hand that's right in the nose. <laughs> and he says, I get it. <laughs> and her story took off like wildfire. We were on the Walter Cronkite show. It, it, she ended up being in the Cyclopedia Britannica. Um, American a Bar Journal wrote a big article about her. So for six months we were in trial. And a legislator who uh, was an animal lover but also liked the publicity, said he would introduce legislation to try to save a life. So he introduced a bill to basically protect uh, all of the dogs and cats in Sido's predicament. You know, back in the day when the pharaoh died, 
he died, and so did his wives, and so did his priests, and uh, so did all of his pets. And the wives got out of that early on, and then the priests also thought it was a good idea that they didn't get included. But the dogs had been left there up until, you know, 1979. So we thought this was time to, to change history and to basically stand up for uh, our uh, family members on four legs. And um, it went through both houses. By the way, it was opposed by all the national organizations. It was opposed by the Humane Society of the United States, a group called Pets and Pals, and all the other local animal welfare organizations. And the, the rationale given at the time was, we have, as a matter of fact, HSUS told me at the time, this is not the current administration, but back in the day, they had file doors of wills where they were going to do what Rebecca Will Smith was being asked to do, which was to pick up the animal from uh, animal control, uh, take it to a local veterinarian, and have the animal put down. And th at the time, that was considered a humane thing to do. Our movement was all about what is the best way to kill an animal, not why should we save it. Today, I don't think there is any justification for killing our companion animals. I don't think we should tolerate, as a country, um, what I consider immoral and unethical acts of putting animals down and justifying it as it's being done by people who care and being done the most humane way possible. When, when we are faced with death, it does not go down well. And those of us who have companion animals, who love them dearly, who um, have part of our soul ripped out of our heart when they go to the next world, know how difficult, how tragic, and how painful it is. But we accept it when it's truly the merciful thing to do. And yet in our shelters throughout the country today, it is being done by the millions for animals that don't deserve it. They don't, they shouldn't actually be in that predicament. 17 million people, 3 million have to go to the shelter or rescue uh, to save their companion animal lives. That's not a huge hill to climb. And I gotta share something with you on a very pragmatic, practical, personal level. Anybody that's adopted from a rescue or a shelter that tells people about where they got their pet makes it seven times more likely that the person you're talking to will adopt from a shelter or a rescue. There, there's, um, there's, I forgot the number, something like 15 million people out there that have adopted from, no, that can't be true. <laughs> we have gone from a nation where we had 24% market share in 2008 to a nation that now has 29% market share. Now, 2008 to today, we've gone through a recession. We've gone through home foreclosures. We've gone through layoffs. We've gone through a, a, a decline in personal wealth. Foundations of uh, reserves have been depleted. <coughs> personal wealth has declined. And in spite of all that, we have increased our market share and reduced the death rate. And a lot of the credit has to go to the humane community, but I'm going to give the lion's share of the credit to the American people. The American people, when asked, what do you think about the relationship you have with your pet, say they're family members. You would not put a family member in a cage. Now, I let my son borrow his car once, and he hit a light pole with it. That's the only time I can think of that could ever justify putting a family member in a cage. So, and, and we put our family members in cages for four days to sometimes a month and in some cases even a lot longer than that. That is outrageous that we uh, deal with our family members that way. When people are asked, if you were stuck on an island and you, were, you had a choice of having another human companion or a four-legged pet, which would you be 62% say they would rather have a four-legged pet? <laughs> By the way, when I was with Saito, I just got a little side sidetrack on Saito. Uh, she never left my side. She was with me wherever I went. So when I went through the shelter, she introduced herself to every potential adopter and gave a big spiel about why you should adopt this dog or why you should adopt this cat. I was mayor, so she used to go to all the public hearings. She was always five feet away from me. I go to the restroom. She was always five feet away from me. People wondered what was going on. Uh, when I got to bed at night, 
uh, because I usually went to bed before my wife. Uh, when my wife did get to bed, Cider would always growl at her. <laughs> that, that created a family situation, another dynamic that I won't get into. Uh, but um, on her 16th birthday, we decided to have a party for her, and all the senators and all the assemblymen that had voted for her, and the cadre of people that had uh, her, her attorneys, and she had a volunteer corps of 3,000 people that were out there beating the bushes trying to uh, save her life. They came to this party, and an hour before we were to cut the cake, she had her first seizure. And uh, we had her take her to UC Davis, and they worked valiantly for uh, four days to try to save her life, and she didn't make it. But she came into the world with great fanfare, and she left uh, the world in a very dramatic way. But everybody that knew her loved her. She became the poster child, from my point of view, for what No Kill is all about. Because if we tell the story, people will listen. And when people listen, people act. And when people act, we can achieve our dreams. We can find homes for all the dogs and cats of America that need somebody to fall in love with and take care of and cherish them as they deserve. So um, one of the things we did, these are just uh, uh, helpful hints of what we did to try to uh, turn the San Francisco situation around. But the, I would like to leave you uh, with the understanding that we are on the brink of success. We are, are at a time in our history when we can cure a social ill. How many causes and how many um, missions can basically point to the time when they were there, when the world turned around? And here in America, we can basically guarantee our dogs and cats, our family members on four legs, a loving home, so that nobody dies. So that the only pets that end up losing their lives are the ones that are considered public health dangers, or the animals that truly have the merciful end because it's the kind of thing that we have to do for our best friends when we can do nothing more for them. But uh, we're not there yet. We can be there. Uh, Maddie's Fund, as uh, Jacqueline was saying, has uh, contributed a lot to helping collaborations, the excellent work like Jane Hoffman, superhero, uh, uh, extraordinaire, uh, unbelievable. I would say that even if she wasn't an attorney, I'm not going to threaten to sue me. Um, but the collaborations throughout the United States that are formed on a single purpose of saving animal lives. And by the way, collaboration is, I don't know how many of you work with collaboration, but it's not an easy thing to do. And people in our movement are very passionate about our, our job and how we go about doing it. And trying to overcome the minor differences of opinion and focusing on what it's really all about is not an easy task. And Jane has done it for 100, 150 organizations. Yeah, yeah. And, and she's only 23. Uh, and I joined the cause when I was 10, so <laughs> that was the youngest person that ever employed in San Francisco. Uh, so um, we, we, we have a wonderful cadre of examples. We also have a new discipline in uh, veterinary medicine called shelter medicine. It just became a board-recognized specialty uh, less than two months ago. Uh, 24 of the 28 veterinary schools now have shelter medicine programs. This is basically teaching the professional core of medical workers who are going to save our companion animals what it's like to work in a shelter. Work. Because it's a little different than working in our homes. Uh, the individual companion animal doesn't have the density of housing issues, doesn't have the behavioral challenges, uh, doesn't have the contagious contagion elements, and therefore um, it is in fact a recognized specialty, and we're delighted to have these new professionals coming into our cause to help us with this uh, big task. Our movement also has a lot more resources. Um, back in the day before Maddie's Fund, less than $1 million of foundation money was given to uh, animal welfare, to dog and cat charities. Uh, this year, that number will be over $100 million, and Maddie's Fund will probably be contributing $50 million of that hundred million. Um, so there's a lot more resources coming into play and then there's a lot more philanthropy coming from the private sector 
a lot more people are recognizing how important it is to basically get to this cost. We represent today less than 1% of philanthropy in, in the country. Uh, most of it goes to universities and to education and to um, medical research um, and to churches um, and synagogues, um, etc. Um, but we represent less than 1%. And yet, with less than 1% of the resources, we've come a long way. We are actually uh, making great progress. I would ask that those of you who are lawyers, going to become lawyers, um, have dedicated yourself to the legal profession, challenge the status quo. I think one of the, the, the things that I look back on that disappoints me is that there has not been enough rancor. While I say we shouldn't be bashing and trashing within, I believe there should be a lot more outrage out there on the amount of killing that's being done in our shelters, holding me and my peers accountable for the fact that millions of dogs and cats have died. When if we just changed policies, we could stop that. It would be very simple in America to basically not take in feral cats into shelters. Because we are not doing anybody any good by killing millions of feral cats. Uh, it doesn't affect the wildlife population. It doesn't decrease uh, the feral cat population. And it's uh, a tragedy that we've lived with for far too long. And just that simple change would save 1.3 million cat lives overnight. And it doesn't cost anything. As a matter of fact, it saves money. So there's a bunch of solutions readily at hand that our industry is reticent, reluctant to embrace. And you as lawyers could be a challenging force to see us wake up and do the right thing. Thank you very, very much. Okay, first of all, I would say that the Alliance would not exist but for Maddie's Fund. And my life would not have been ruined except for this gentleman. <laughs> so bearing that in mind, I'm going to run through what, how we created the Alliance. Um, we started the Alliance in 2000 working with the New York City Bar Association Animal Law Committee, of which I'm one of the founding members and some other members are here. I welcome them. Um, by sending a memo to Mike Bloomberg's administration when he came in and said, you know, there's like five issues in New York City your administration can be doing much better on. And the lead off one was animal care and control. And we said, you know, there's this fabulous foundation in California, and we're New York, we're the center of the universe. We should be able to get Maddie's Fund money. Um, Mike loved the public private partnership. So we said, if you work with us, the city of New York, be it Mike's administration, we think we can attract this private money to come into New York to help us create innovative solutions to the crisis at that point of animal population in New York City, it's focusing on cats and dogs. The Alliance now does more animals than just cats and dogs, but our focus has always been cats and dogs. So we thought about why, why were we going to create this? So it was to pool resources, because it's ridiculous for everybody to be trying to do the same thing, overcome a difference in priorities, because like Rich said, shelters and rescues and nonprofits, open admission, limited admission, have different priorities and what their responsibilities are. This is a very dense PowerPoint, by the way. I apologize for that, but you're going to get it, I understand. So if I go a little bit quickly over that, I assume you will be able to read this later, if you even care. <laughs> we, so we were doing that. We also were facilitating a collaboration. So it was between Mike's administration that was coming in, the New York City public, which, as Rich said, is vitally important to help us solve this, Animal Care Control of New York City, which was um, the agency, which is a not-for-profit in New York City. It was created to take... <laughs> I hope that was not much. Um, so it was created to um, take over the contract when the ASPCA, which had for hundreds of years um, had the animal control contract with the city of New York, 
decided, along with the whole national movement, that humane societies and SPCAs really should be putting their money into adoption, spay-neuter, humane education, doing what their mission was and not performing this municipal obligation, like Rich said. So we were going to work with them, and because that's where the animals were. And then we were going to work with the local animal rescue groups and shelters, who many of them knew who I was because I was the only one who would stand up and moderate um, programs that the New York City Bar Association did in the evenings at our animal law conference. And we actually did one, which, but for Joyce Tischler, who's right next door, and the Animal Legal Defense Fund would not have happened because they helped us put on the um, 1999 99 annual conference, the non uh, the legal status of non-human animals, which was actually groundbreaking. We brought together all of the major lawyers practicing in that area at that time. Uh, but I digress. But that's how the local shelters and rescue groups kind of knew who I was. So when I went to them and started to say, join us, join us in this, they kind of knew who I was already. So what we are now is a coalition of 150 animal rescue groups and shelters, including ACC private practice veterinarians. We have a whole cadre of what we call our feral friendly veterinarians who know how to do spay neuter safely for our feral, our community cats, which is basically what we call them in New York City and across the country. Um, actually, Alley Cat Allies just did National Feral Cat Day and they've had this, um, what's his name? Galaxy? The cat guy. Jackson Galaxy. Jackson Galaxy. He did fabulous. So go on and look at YouTube. It's this fabulous explaining what community cats were and why you should care for them. Um, don't you love it that this big tattooed guy is talking about cats I love that. <laughs> and other animal welfare professionals like you know trainers, groomers, etc. So we were the lead agency. We were set up as the lead agency over this coalition um, to secure the multi-year, multi, multi, multi million dollar Maddie Swim Grant, which we very proudly got in 2005. Uh, we started working with Maddie's Fund in 2003. It took two years and 20 years off my life to get it. Um, but we were then the liaison between Maddie's Fund and the rescue groups and shelters because Maddie's Fund's largesse actually flows through the alliance to the animal rescue groups and shelters in the form of adoption um, guarantee uh, bonuses is the way I thought of it. Um, I came in to do this because I obviously, being trained in taxation, executive compensation, employee benefits, knew exactly what to do. In <laughs> but I was supposed to bring the business sense. That was my sort of value added. And I'm not kidding, he ruined my life. He's the one who said I had to do this and we were gonna get the money. So, just so you understand, the way this works is Animal Control has a contract with the mayor's office through the Department of Health. They are required, they're an open admission shelter, they're required to take every animal that's brought to their door. We help them create, actually the Alliance is a very large marketing and distribution network, okay? Keep that in mind, that's my Wall Street background. It's marketing, animal care and control is wholesale. They have the merchandise, they have the snapple. You need to get to the people who can, the retailers who can move that product, which is our animals. And it was creating the marketing. That's the New Hope Department. The New Hope Department, all they do, it was originally a grant-funded uh, department at ACC. They were ACC employees. But all they did was be the liaisons to the animal rescue groups and shelters with phone calls, with emails, with um, various ways to market the animals that were in the shelter that they needed these groups to step up and take to help get them adopted. So there was the New Hope Department. They signed an agreement with the Animal Care and Control. We have what we call Terms of Participation, which basically harkens back to the, what you call bash and trash. We call no trash talking. Um, be nice. If you're not nice, you're not gonna participate in this. And then who's gonna lose? The animals are gonna lose. So we call our groups the um, Alliance, Participating uh, Alliance Participating Organizations, APOs, the 150 of them now, the majority of the New Hope Partners are Alliance members. Um, we did a memorandum of understanding with the city. We did an operational protocol. We do not get a penny from the city, by the way, where it flows the other way. So we came up with a 10-year strategic plan, which again, I have to credit or blame Maddie's Fund. They insisted we had to put together a 10-year strategic plan. I actually now have gone to conferences, and I was like, you can imagine, I, I actually have a really nasty vocabulary usually and a terrible temper, and you can imagine what I was saying about this. Yes, Nancy can attest to that. <laughs> um, 
And, but it is the single best thing we ever did. Because if you don't do a strategic plan, you don't have a roadmap, you don't know what you're measuring. If you can't measure it, you can't solve it. So you have to be able to measure it. So a strategic plan is key. And it's not rocket science. It's really, I mean, I was fortunate enough, I had some friends from McKinsey who, because of my Wall Street background, have helped put this together. But you don't even need that level of expertise, actually. You just decide, what are your objectives? So we came up with four core objectives many of which, or two of which, were directly from the mission statement from Maddie's Fund, which was increase adoptions and increase spay neuter. We used decrease animal homelessness because we were also bundling with spay neuter. We were talking about humane education, responsible pet ownership, not humane education. We have Hart here who does a wonderful job, me and Alec Appen, and, and so we don't have to do that. Not everybody has to do the same thing. But that was our spay-neuter component, responsible pet ownership, <coughs> licensing, microchipping, all that kind of stuff. And then raise awareness because, um, you know, our market share has increased because we have done such a good job um, in creating the hook for the media. One of the single best hooks we've had in New York City is the Maddie's Pet Adoption Days, which many of you may have heard about, which is the adoption fee-waived uh, weekend extravaganza. Um, and the media love that because, they, you know, they, they, after a while they're like, oh, adoption event, oh, whatever. But you put that, they're all free. They're all spayed and neutered. They're all vaccinated. Most of them are microchip. These, we're going to create loving families by giving these people, you know, animals. They, they go through the same procedure about the adoption, but they are free. So the people can then go to Petco and spend more money than God on their pets. <laughs> <laughs> and the other thing was just strengthening resources because we owe it to the animals to be better and more efficient in what we do. So we wanted to put some training into this idea. We were trying to raise the game, you know, the bar for these groups about what they could do. Um, and why it's so important is it forces the definition of concrete achievable goals. You know, inspiration is nice, but if you don't know how you're going to get there, helps identify and prioritize your needed activities based on cost and impact in your own community, provides key metrics and checkpoints to measure whether or how you're on track or you're not on track, and how you're applying your limited resources, because even with um, Maddie's generosity, um, and we're also supported by the ASPCA as well as private donors, it's limited. It's still limited based on what we need to do out there. And then most importantly, frankly, it's a proof of concept and a selling document for funders and your board members. Um, so the key elements, vision, mission, goals, objectives, planned initiatives or activities, key, what your key factors are going to be, key metrics, organizational structure, and your funding source or plan. And again, you'll, I think you're going to have this. So, All right. So inspiration of what you hope is your vision, your mission is why your organization exists, your objectives and goals, what you need to achieve to achieve your vision and satisfy your mission, and then your initiatives are what projects do you need to do to achieve your goals. I don't know why they always put this in. I don't understand this slide, so I'm going to move on. <laughs> <laughs> there's, so I said there's four core objectives. The first is increased adoptions. Okay, increased venues, convenient and innovative access, adoption bans. Petco, PetSmart, your local pet store, independent pet store, and then stores that have nothing to do. We just did a big event with a realty company that had actually had one of the people adopt from one of our shelters who decided they wanted to do an adoption event outside their business. They were fabulous. They reach a whole other audience that we would never have reached. Um, and apparently, I think they had a dog playgroup or something, boarding facility right near them, who then jumped into the action. So again, work with your community. And it doesn't only have to be animal people. We don't need to keep talking to ourselves. We're not the ones we need to convince. So then decreased homelessness, as I said, was increased spay neuter of own pets, but also our community cats. That was vitally important to me. Keep pets in their homes, responsible pet ownership, and reunite lost pets with their people. Um, that's microchipping and that's dog licensing. Um, in New York City, we don't license cats, we only license dogs. Um, public education, raise awareness. Talk about the animals themselves, which a lot of people think are damaged somehow or diseased or there's something wrong with them if they're in shelters. And then also talk about the role of the shelters and the rescue groups and that they're in every community in New York City and they need to support them. Matter of fact, one of the first things we did was this big event um, in Central Park, which is the jewel in the crown of the Parks Department of New York City. We were right in the center at 72nd Street. We had gotten um, actually a small grant from the ASPCA to allow groups 
to make themselves look good. We actually had an international retail design person come in and talk, and who knew? Who knew such people existed? But they came in and talked about how to set up so people are attracted to come and do whatever you were offering them. So we got green market tents, you know, those 10 by 10, and everybody had to have t-shirts. It's like market yourself, people. <coughs> and if you don't look good, your animals aren't gonna look good. And I'm sorry, it is a consumer product in New York City or all over the country, actually. They obviously, to us and to their families, are more important, but you need to start thinking, this is a consumer product, we need to market them, we need to increase our market share, we need three million more people to get out there and, and um, adopt them. But there were hundreds of people, you can imagine, Central Park, Saturday, hundreds if not thousands of people streaming through. And what I heard was two things that made me do the little happy dance, which was, oh my God, these are shelter animals, number one, and number two, good Lord, I didn't know I had a rescue group in Queens. So it's like, get out there, market yourself, make yourself look good. And then finally, the strength and resources was, um, you know, just encouraging people to how to get and train and retain volunteers. That's always really difficult. Um, how to do fundraising. And then shelter and rescue group operations. And I think there's some examples later of some of those courses. But every month, we do a training program. And it can be from estate planning, uh, which actually, if you have your own animals or you are a feral cat caregiver and a community cat caregiver, who's going to come over and take over your policy? You might not think you have, a, you don't have enough resources to make that a bit, you know, possible, but you do. Actually, a term life insurance policy is not very expensive, and if that allows somebody to take over and care for your community, I mean, your community of cats. That's really important. But we also do infection control in foster homes. We do a whole series of our feral cat initiative training, which I'll get to later, but bottle feeding, taming feral kittens, neighbor relations, um, and then we just created with ASPCA, the Alley Cat Allies, and the Mayor's Alliance created a new trap and return um, course, which we teach in person in all the boroughs, but we also do online. Um, so this is what we achieved. In 2002, um, or three, the first year of our full year of operations, um, animal care and control, New York City, was killing almost 32,000 cats and dogs every year. By creating the collaboration by the end of, and we do our numbers on an annual basis, which is why I don't have 2014, we were down to just about 6,000 cats and dogs, redu reduced that much euthanasia or killing in New York City. We are projecting that number will drop to 4,000 at the end of this year. And, yeah. I'm going to go quickly through this. This was just the euthanasia breakdown. This was the intake reduction. The, the important part of this is uh, we were fortunate enough in New York City, and also we had a spay-neuter grant from Maddie's Fund as well, um, while that first initial grant was going on. Um, we have the ASPCA, which has created enormous spay-neuter capacity in New York City. They run two stationary clinics, which are for the rescue groups and the TNR community, and they run um, five vans um, that do the public. Well, I wish they did the public, but they do the animals. <laughs> <laughs> because, you know, rescue groups, as you guys probably know, is they would rather cut off their right arm than miss a spay-neuter appointment, where the public, you know, because they used to do the rescue community and TNR also on the vans, and we realized we need to bring that capacity to the neighborhoods, make it as easy as possible for the people, so they don't get discouraged, because if they got turned away, they might not come back. So, obviously, reducing um, intake is really important as well. So, I'm gonna just do this quickly. Um, our first objective, it's like, okay, what, what are you, what's going to make up that objective? So increase adoptions. We gave a transfer initiative grant for um, seven years to Animal Care Control to develop the New Hope Department, which is the department I mentioned, the marketing department at ACC, which works specifically and only with the rescue groups to get the animals out as quickly as possible. Um, just strengthening communications at the, you know, the internet is such a double-edged sword because there's so much nonsense that goes on there, but without it, we would not have been able to achieve what we've achieved. Um, because through emails that go out every day to the groups from New Hope about the dogs and cats they want people to look at. There's a couple of different mechanisms, which I think there's some illustrations for later. The distribution part of the network was the Wheels of Hope transport program, because most of the people are volunteers. They have full-time jobs. It's their passion, but they have to work. So we created a fleet of vans 
Um, we have six cargo vans that are specially made to transport animals. We have separate air conditioning and heating in the front for the driver and the back, and I really don't care about the driver that much, but the animals are very comfortable. Um, and they run seven days a week. I have three um, employees. That's They're the transport coordinators or air traffic control. That's all they do. Um, and they get the animals from animal control. It's Again, it's just creating infrastructure and process and procedure. It's really not sexy, it's really boring, but it's the thing that moves the animals and moves the needle. So it's there's forms that come from New York, I'm sorry, New Hope, that goes to my people, who then get together with the rescue group and figure out where the animals are gonna go, kind of thing. That was crucial to this. That allows us to get them out quickly, makes more room, creates more room, and um, has really been a very crucial thing for us. Pets to the people, again, I mentioned mobile adoptions. Um, we've been encouraging groups that are capable of taking an adoption van program on to do that. It really makes a big difference, again, meet people in their neighborhoods. Um, because a lot of people in New York don't have cars. If they have cars, they're small cars. There's nowhere to park them anyway. You can't take dogs on the subway except in an emergency. So, you know, we want to get out to the people. Special adoption events. We have a medical fund. If an, if an animal is taken from animal care control in one of the groups, um, you know, it was a larger medical bill than they had intended to get into. We try to help them with that. Um, we have a weekly spot, actually, on two NBC segments, and then just consistent adoption locations. So the transfers, what moved this needle, especially at the beginning, was the transfer of the, um, to the, um, I'm sorry, the transfer <coughs> from ACC to the groups. And it, as you can see, from 2003 through 2009, it really just increased. Um, and that shows that, and you know, and the ACC was doing the best they could do, um, though with the draconian uh, budget cuts they got, um, they really, they didn't have an adoption department. They didn't have a lost and found department. We had to help them recreate that. Um, so this is another way of looking at it. It's live release. Um, at the end of last year was 27% um, dog cat. Um, this is the ACC transfer, and sorry, you can look at those on your own time. The new hook department is, this is what they have to do. It's a very well-developed program, and there's really, um, it's not to keep people out. It's to make sure, I, think about this. You, adoption groups grill the people almost sometimes too much that they adopt to. But we expect shelters to just hand over animals to any rescue group that comes. Not right. They need to be held to a certain level of ability to take care of the animals because they have come into the care of the shelter and they need to be, if they're going to be transferred, they need to be transferred to groups that are capable of taking care of these animals. Okay, these are the first alerts. Um, <laughs> live long and prosper. These are, the group, these are the first alerts that go out from Animal Care and Control's New Hope Department to the groups every single day. There's three days of these that go out. The minute the animal hits the shelter, they try to get a picture and a certain amount of information out to the group so the groups can start to plan to pull, is what we call them, these animals. They give all the how to get in touch with them. And this they developed with us about what the groups needed. Here's the first alert for cats. None of them look all that happy. <laughs> but they're all green cats, which means they're all can go to any home. Um, again, special pleas for dogs. And um, we have a lot of big dogs. We have six in New York City. Again, these go out from the um, New Hope to the APOs. Um, special pleas for cats. Um, the first alerts I should explain go are automatically generated by Chameleon. So they are just, the minute the animal comes in, they go out to the groups that are signed up for, which are basically everybody. The special pleas that I was showing you, these are very labor intensive. They're much longer, actually, and they are created by the New Hope staff. If there was a safer assessment, they um, utilize that. If there was a volunteer comment, if there's medical notes, they're very long to try to tell groups exactly what they're going to get. We worked for a year with New Hope to um, come up with uh, what's called the at-risk website. This is the website that lets um, groups know who very well may be at risk for euthanasia, and that's why we call it the at-risk list the next day. So it goes out, it's an interactive website, because the problem was when they were doing it just with email alerts, five groups could be working on the same dog, and then by the time they get back there, the dog has been pulled a long time ago, and they, they could have saved four other dogs in the meantime. So it's an interactive that if you go on there, you see an animal you want, you can push, click the button, 
and it turns green and says, I have been called by one of your rescue partners. You know, if you want to put in a second request in case that falls through, do that. But if not, move on, save somebody else who's on this list. Um, and enormous amounts of animals get pulled off there. You know, Rich was talking about transparency, and ACC um, is so transparent at this point that they actually are getting attacked by people who are using the information they're putting out there to act as if this is some big secret they're revealing to the world, which is really aggravating, but. <laughs> okay, the Wheels of Hope transport program are most effective in reducing and sustaining. I talked about that before, that's one of the bans. Um, that's one of our drivers, Debbie, who's a big hero. During Sandy, she was everywhere pulling. And people would come out in the street and beg her to hold up their animals and beg her to take them, and we were able to help a lot of them. The dog on the left is a very elderly Dalmatian who is coming out of ACC, going to Dalmatian Rescue, and is like a different dog today. Um, again, more than 2.4 million since 2005, as of the end of 2013. Um, very, very important. This is some of the mobile adoption vans. We were given a van by PECO Foundations as part of an event we did with them, but the ASPCA has them, Sean Casey Rescue has them. More and more of our groups are getting these vans and they're just wonderful. They're actually, like, the window rolls up, as you can see, and it's really a direct, com you know, competition to the puppy dog in the window thing. Um, we do special adoption events. We do Maddie's Adoption Days, as you can see. We do something called adopt a palooza which is, um, focuses a lot on responsible pet ownership and our relationship with the city. We have Office of Emergency Management come and tell what to do for your, with your pets in an emergency. We have DOH coming and doing dog licensing. We have the police come and um, we have a new unit that's being formed in New York City called um, Animal Cruelty Unit. Um, NYPD has taken over since January, uh, primary enforcement of the animal cruelty laws in New York City. We also do Whiskers in Wonderland, which is primarily cats and rabbits, though I always say I have no idea how Sean Casey sneaks in a iguana every single year. <laughs> I say Sean, Sean, iguanas, no whiskers, no. So this is our medical fund. It's basically working with um, our vets, and because of the amount of work we do, we have been able to negotiate a rescue reduction for medical care at the vets that work with our groups because of you know just the economy of size. Um, we have a weekly um, adoption <coughs> spot. Um, that's Howard Stern's wife in the, on the right there. Um, and the segment adoption rate is, again, it's like just show the people, these animals, like Rich says, 88% adoption. We had one group I had to argue into going on to this. We'll remain nameless. A shelter. No, it was a shelter. And they finally came on to it. They brought like four dogs with them, some of them which were, were elderly. And they said by the time they got back to the shelter, their phones were ringing off the hook. Every single one of those animals and many others got adopted. But the best thing from their point of view was a gentleman wrote, drove down to them, walked into the front desk, and handed them a $500 check and said, I didn't even know you were here. So that's the importance of getting the word about the shelters and the animals. Again, location, location, location. Your retail sales, be where the people are and be there regularly. Decrease homelessness, our New York City Feral Cat Initiative, we've created infrastructure and services and resources for that community, who God knows, you know, need it. They're tireless out there. We have a trap bank, we have training sessions. Uh, we do transport of traps, because as I said, none of us have cars, so how do you get the traps from the bank? How do you get, the, you know, you keep 10 traps in your bathroom, you'll never shower again in New York City. <laughs> So stay neuter, we depend on our partners, the Maine Society of New York, the ASPCA, Toby Project, which was one vet who just decided he was gonna run a mobile adoption van, and he does, it's fabulous. Lost and Found, we recreated that program when it was stopped because of um, budget cuts. We're now working again with ACC on that, dog licensing, and helping pets and people in crisis is our um, domestic violence program. Um, it's people to our shame in New York City, we only have a few shelters just recently, and they're not city shelters that take pets in with their people when they come in. Urban Resource Institute, you can look at their website, have a wonderful program called PAL that does take um, pets of domestic violence victims. And we help create that program and we um, provide a lot of support to it. The ASPCA also gave a grant um, at my urging to um, hire a person to do that full time on the staff of URI, so it's wonderful. So. You know, the reason we do, it's within our mission, Feral Cats, is 
increased cat take and cat euthanasia, as Rich said, is what results from them going into shelters. Um, and then increased cost to the shelter, less available space and resources for the adoptable cats, and complaint calls to animal control, increased stress on shelter workers handling these cats who should not be there, and it takes resources from other programs. So ACC is a very strong um, supporter of trap neuter return. I'm very proud in New York City. We passed a law two years ago, um, Local Law 59, that makes um, TNR the policy of New York City. DOH has a website page about trap neuter return, um, and you know, we're working with city agencies on an agency by agency basis. There are issues sometimes with parks or transportation where, you know, cats are in a dangerous place. Anyway, we have a bunch of um, uh, materials, um, doorknob hangers and things like that, which we'd be happy to share. If you go onto the Feral Cat Initiative website of the Alliance, you can see all the, the things we have. So those are the goals. Cut down on the number of cats. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, so this is the love-hate posters. Um, these are very effective in communities. If you love them, you hate them, it doesn't matter. TNR is still the answer. We have these right now in English and Spanish. We're gonna translate them into Mandarin, um, Korean, um, some of the other major languages in New York City. Um, this is to encourage people, if you're feeding a stray, you're doing a good thing, but contact us because we'd like to help you get them or get train you to get them spayed or neutered again. Spanish and English, we're translating them to several other languages. Um, low cost spay and neuter, I mentioned this, our fellow friendly ASPCA, Humane Society, Toby Project. Uh, this is our lost, these are two of our office cats. Um, they both have leukemia positive, which is why they're with us. Um, but this, was the, this is Melissa Donaldson, one of my employees who have created it and runs it today. Um, free and low cost microchipping clinics, we do that a lot. It's part of our goal to reunite. And don't you love this guy here on the left, the face? It's like, dude, it's not you. It's the dog. Just relax. Um, be fine. Um, we, we collaborate with the Department of, Health, uh, Department of Health on licensing. It's very important to us. It, you know, our return to owner is inching up um, slightly, but you know, it's, a lot of people don't keep the tags on. You know, they're jingling really in the loudest city in, in the world. And, yeah, <laughs> jingling, yeah. But anyway, which is why we push both licensing because it is the law, and also because it's. Um, yeah, it's a law and it does help get them home. So this is helping pets and people in crisis, um, uh, raising awareness. We've done a lot of stunts, frankly, because that's what, you know, Rich is the master of this, but that's what gets it, you know, gets people's attention or people's attention that normally wouldn't. We did the New York State, uh, the New York Stock Exchange closing bell with Maddie um, acting out there on the podium. Um, that was part of our I Love New York City Pets, which is February, we just picked that. Um, we do the Brooklyn Cyclones. It's our one of our minor league teams out in Coney Island. Um, we do that. Maddie throws out the first ball. We have a microchipping. We have adoption. Um, Alex and Annie. We've had a wonderful partnership with them. And actually, I'm I'm wearing it right now. In case any of you want to go on the Alex and Annie website, we trade. We have a trademark uh, logo, and they made it a logo of it, and they sell it and give us 20% of the proceeds. Uh, which has been wonderful. That is about that partnership is about to end. But think about that. How can you make partnerships with retailers who want to have a charitable contribution, but you know may not be able to? And finally, we do. That's Mary Tyler Moore, etc. Bernadette Peters, um, and we do Broadway Barks, which is the theater community's way to become involved. In July, we go out and we have a very big event, and we pair casts of uh, Broadway shows with. Um, the, with animal rescue groups and shelters that participate, and it's a lot of fun. Uh, this was a blessing of the animals. Dolan, we're the only ones that ever done it at St. Patrick's Cathedral. NYPD actually stops traffic on Fifth Avenue so we can turn our van around so the <coughs> cardinal can go and bless the animals so that the windows are on the right side. Um, we did that again this year. We do something called, Ar again, a hook for the media. We do Arctics for Animals as a group that gets architects together to design what often are completely useless cat shelters. <laughs> but we had an article in the New York Times about it, talking about community cats and you know winter shelters and, and all that kind of stuff. Like that, knit, you know what? That knitting needle thing that actually like lasted about two weeks. <laughs> okay, so adopt me best. 
it was also a way for us to fulfill our recognition how we wanted to recognize maddie's fund about being a major force in helping new york city so we put the adopt me that a little patch maddie's fund patch on our adoption vests also we needed to do this because the very first event we did we had people um at that big event i talked about and it was fabulous and all these dogs are being walked around and and people kept walking up to people and trying to adopt their already owned dog. <laughs> <laughs> and that in New York, so we decided well, we need something to set aside the adoption. <laughs> so of course we do social media, none of which I know how to do, and yes, I am not on Facebook. So I will never have that ethics problem because I don't have any Facebook. But I have wonderful people who work for me to do. Um, again, newsletters, get the stories out. Um, Maddie's Fund um, had this uh, groundbreaking thing with HSUS with the Ad Council. It's the first time I think they've ever done an animal one. And um, so they have these great shelter pet project ones, which I encourage you to go on and take a look at. They're really clever. Um, so more of them. I love this. She snores more than I do, but I still love my human. <laughs> I don't know if any of you have that at home, but... Um, Okay, so this is the outdoor ones. Are my legs too short? Does this fur make me look fat? Do I need to do something with my hair? Do my ears make my head look small? <laughs> so these are fabulous. This was a campaign we created specifically for New York, which are PSAs about fantasy. And we are happy to give this campaign to anybody who would like to use it. We will send you the artwork, and you can stick your own um, whatever on it, name. Um, but it's, you know... Where there's a void in your life, there's a vacancy in your life, and this is where these pets should be. Um, then we then did a We Did It, um, a spay and neuter campaign in front of our three of our iconic um, landmarks Brooklyn, in Brooklyn, Queens, and the Bronx, the Yankee Stadium. And by the way, I am a Red Sox fan, but I still allowed them to do Yankee Stadium. Um, the Unisphere, and then uh, in Prospect Park, the Arch. Um, these are hilarious. Do go onto our website to look at them. These were some very clever people who did this program for us. These are TV <clears throat> as their 30 seconds. And actually, some of these people you probably have seen as extras or background people in some of the shows that come out of New York City, but they very generously donated their time. Um, and actually, the gentleman on the left there, this was the Spanish language one we did, was actually, before he started this, terrified of pit bulls. Um, and by the end of it, they were napping together. That was your new napping buddy. Um, so please go take a look at these. These are our spay-neuter ones. There's one on the, well, it's my left, I guess. It, no, it's your left, too. Um, ready to go, says star after minor procedure. That dog belonged to Bernadette Peters and is a fabulous actress because she was portraying a male dog, but she was a fat <laughs> <white> female. <laughs> and then the one on the right, we got the gentleman who was there um, doing Equus at the time, the play Equus, who was a Scottish actor doing The Therapist oh. and um, voiced the Scotty dog talking about and doing a riff on, um, on 007, <laughs> the procedure. Um, it was a cat fortune telling. This is one of ACC's latest. It's a wonderful one called New York's Kindest and Take Off on Our Strongest, Bravest, uh, etc. Um, so that was wonderful. This was another one a while ago, which I thought was really wonderful at the time. It's Victims of Circumstance. It's not my fault. It's the owner relocated, owner missing, owner allergic kind of thing. It's not their fault. Um, and then finally, Strength and Resources, Capacity Building Grants, uh, Create a New ISO Unit, um, various things. Strength training is what I talked about. Strength and communications, transfer initiative, wheels of hope, the medical fund. A lot of these initiatives will cross. Matter of fact, when we decided on our four core objectives and, and then we went on to plan initiatives, any initiative had to hit at least two of our core objectives to stay on the table to discuss them. Because if it didn't have that much of an impact, at least two of the core, we didn't want to use it. So this was a capacity building grant, Animal Haven, one of our founding members, has a storefront adoption center. It's fabulous. I'll never do it again with the construction issues in New York, but it's a fabulous room, um, largest activity room for animals in New York City, actually. Building an isolation unit, the strength trainings, um, and you'll recognize that guy in the picture on the top with Mike. That was just maintaining the relationship um, with the city of New York. This, I think, just shows the, really the collaboration between the ASPCA, the Animal Care and Control, and the Mayor's Alliance of New York City. And that's what's moved the needle, engaging all of the people who have an interest in this and those, of those, those who do not yet know they have an interest in this um, to work together. <laughs> Thank you. Yes. Hi, I'm from, I'm from Sonoma.
Sonoma, California, and I'm, I'm going to be stealing your Is Your Dog Real Sonoman, so thank you very much. My pleasure. It's a bit. Um, do you guys give any money for people to be able to keep their pets if they come into a shelter and you do ask them what do you need, whether it's food, money for fences, etc.? Yeah, and it actually, because of as part of Local Law 59, I mentioned that um, they obtain our policy in the city, um, it also increased their budget. And one of the things they have slowly but surely is rebuilding their departments, and they have something called the Admissions Department now, which is not just in day. And they try to counsel people to um, what do they need to keep their animals. I mean, often when people get to the shelter, they come to the end of their rope and they can't. But if it is a matter of helping them, putting together with resources. We also have a HSUS program, which is people loving pets or something like that. They keep changing the name for me. I can't remember anything in day anymore anyway. But they also will provide certain low-cost resources. Um, we Pets for Life. Pets for Life. Yeah, Pets for Life. But I think they changed the name again. But anyway, did they change the name? Yeah, they did. Yeah. Anyway. So we do, you know, ACC does their part in trying to um, keep resource of giving, re keeping animals out of the shelter. The pets for life, whatever it's called, does the same thing. We will occasionally doing resources we already have in place, like do you need a ride to the vet? Because like the Humane Society of New York has very low cost yes. clinical stuff that they can do for people. So we do that. But we don't, I mean, we don't really help the New York City public unless there's a very, very specific reason that we would do that. We really are there to be the resources of the city. And one other thing I just wanted to add is part of the original negotiations with the city, I said it's a law in New York City that 2000, um, in 2000 they passed a law that said all animals that come out of animal care control have to be spayed and neutered prior to adoption. At the time that law also increased, also included pet stores. And the evil pet lobby got an injunction against it and stopped it. But I'm very proud to say with the ASPCA and many other groups working on it, the New York State Legislature and the governor signed a bill that gave New York home rule with respect to regulating pet stores. So there's a bill about to be passed that will require every New York City pet store that sells. It, we are not allowed to ban sales, but we can. We'll, we will make it so difficult. <laughs> but ACC um, stays and neuters, vaccinates, microchips, and gives the animals to the rescue groups for free. And then we transport them. So ACC has a lot of skin in the game um, doing that. This is a very long answer to your really kind of short question, so I apologize, but I tend to do that. I Thanks for all you do. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, yeah, I'm just wondering, um, do you have um, any markers that the, uh, the rescues have to meet on some sort of regular basis and report to you so that, to, so that you can be assured that they're avoiding saturation you know, and that they'll, that they'll be available to you to take these animals? Well, uh, we, we look at a global uh, context, and so we would contract with um, the Mayor's Alliance, and then the Mayor's Alliance gets into the nitty-gritty about what agencies are going to take, what number of animals, and how well they're taking care of their responsibilities, and what their turnover is, and all that sort of stuff. So we contract with one entity, and then that entity contracts with subgroups. And those subgroups basically have an achievement responsibility to basically come through with the result. We don't, can, we require uh, quarterly reports, actually they're monthly, but uh, we evaluate them on a quarterly basis. And if the organizations don't meet their targets, then we stop funding. Mm -hmm. So uh, we we pay on performance, and it's part of our accountability structure. Yeah. And our, our accountability is basically on live sale. How many animals have been found homes, and what is the reduction in euthanasia rate? Uh, and how the organizations go about spending the money is usually, from our point of view, left up to the alliance and left up to the individual partners. Uh, for instance, for our uh, Mali Pet Adoption Days, we give New York a little bit more than $5 million. Uh, but the organizations that get the money from that $5 million can pretty much spend it any way they want. But the idea is you've got a lot of money a lot more money than you had before, but now you've got to do something with it so it makes it easier for you to do it. Not going forward. 
Yeah, I think that's a good question. I'm glad you brought that up because there is a lot of accountability for groups from our point of view. You join us, you have to be, now usually you have to be a new book partner before, for six months and in good standing before we'll allow anybody new into the alliance. Um, but every month under the Maddie's Fund, we continued this, which was a real, again, it was like, really, Rich, you're going to really make me do this? But it was fabulous because it taught us to teach our groups that they need to be responsible for their inventory. So every month, and I'm sorry I'm talking in business terms, but this is the way I think about this. Um, the, we got a monthly report, and we had to sh they had to show how many animals did you take in, where did they come from, animal care control, or the public, or another rescue group. And because we were trying to drive traffic, thanks to Maddie's Fund, to ACC, we paid more money. It was 5 to 1 <coughs> ratio between you would get more money if you took them from ACC. It wasn't when you took them, it was when you got them adopted. And then you had to tell us what happened. How many got adopted? How many from which source got adopted? Did you have to euthanize anybody? Did you transfer to another group? So it was a great way to teach people they should be aware of what animals they had in their care. And if they had to, and it was a great way for us to be able to monitor. Uh, you've just taken 70 animals, and I've seen 20 adoptions, um, you know, where, et cetera. So it was a good, and usually we weren't going to be the police. We were going to say, what resources do you need? you know, for us to help you with. Like, for instance, recently we started using our adoption ban for groups, especially groups that don't have shelters or rescue groups. But you, you, the groups had to show the numbers and show us they saved the lives to get the adoption subsidies, and they were adoption subsidies. I don't know, does that answer your question? It does. Okay. Thank you. Thanks. Got one on the way back. Hi. Um, I'm actually from Montreal, Canada. Um, I uh, run a shelter or currently took over a shelter that seven years ago uh, was basically an animal control facility. We were euthanizing, or the organization then was euthanizing 80% of the animals uh, with no spay neuter initiatives. They really were simply a charitable organization that was acting like a pound. Um, when I started, the first thing that we did was every animal that came in was spayed and neuter. Uh, again, I'm an attorney by training, and I said, bring it on, let people sue us. Your animal comes through the door. Even as a stray, we're going to spay and neuter your animal. They're not going out. Uh, we have a CNR program have kept our municipal contracts. Um, however, what I've done is require that municipalities that want to work with us um, have to uh, pay for TNR. They have to modify their bylaws so that no animal can be sold and else for sale or given away on spade or neuter in pet stores. They have to require mandatory spade neuter for stray animals. So I think we're doing all the right things, but we've maintained our, we call them animal services contracts. Uh, we reduced our dog rate to zero. We work with rescue groups. The problem we're still having is with cats. Um, so our cat use data is still at about 25 to 30 percent, and we're sort of at a major turning point where we're determining do we want to continue with animal services contracts, or do we want to become essentially a limited intake facility? Um, and one of the struggles we have with the other alternative in Montreal for animal control is a for-profit facility that actually uh, there was a cover investigation done about a year ago with forest and cruelty going on. So my question, I guess, would be. Given sort of that factual situation, would you recommend that we continue forward? We take in 15,000 animals a year. We are on limited intake for the boroughs that we serve. Continue with the animal services contract, or that we really want to reduce our euthanasia rate and focus more on the proactive initiatives? Would it be better to take the route of becoming um, fully a, a limited intake shelter that uh, no longer takes in as many animals that come through the door and focus more on our TNR state? I think, I think every organization has to decide for itself what its mission is. Uh, in San Francisco, when we gave up the contract, we thought we could do a better job with our board of directors and our membership and our volunteers telling us what to do as opposed to the elected officials. Now, at one point in my life, I was mayor and council member and planning commissioner and all that kind of stuff. But I believe in the not for profit sector, I believe that our contributors were the ones that were giving money and it should be. The organization should spend the money that our contributors give based upon what they thought was the organization. So I am not a fan, uh, but it works in a lot of different communities, but I'm not a fan of taking government money to run not-for-profits. I think not-for-profits many times are exploited. Uh, the city salaries are a lot more expensive than the not-for-profit sector, and they get away with underpaying uh, the um, the NGOs, because the NGOs are passionate about the cause, and they 
uh, don't pay their people as well as they should, and therefore uh, the city gets a good deal. They get the blame of the NGO, and um, the service isn't up to those standards. But every organization has to decide for itself how it can best use its resources to basically advance the cause that it's identified for what it wants to achieve. There is no, in my view, there is no magic answer for what that is. That's why we have 12,000 different organizations, and I personally think that that's a blessing, as opposed to all of us following one cookbook or one, uh, one methodology or one approach to life saving. I have a slightly different opinion. I think it depends on. Um, I have. Um, uh, I think it depends on how well compensated you are. I mean, the rich is saying, so are you going to take advantage yes. of, um, which often happens. But to me, I think we have had um, an enormous amount of, there's all, it's all about money at the end of the day. You know, I'm not a genius. I have a lot of money to work with from Maddie's fund in the UK. Um, but the best and the brightest need, I think, at this point, need to be at ACC and Care Control. We have a very good senior management there now, and they really are making enormous strides. Yes, we volunteer there on my own law committee and I are in. So, you know, it's a, it's a dilemma. It's you need to make up your own mind. And yes, the, the money, it, it's often you're taking advantage of. But animal control, to me, is so important. Because in New York, we only have one animal care control and um, that serves the five boroughs, and they just need to be the best. They need to be doing it and better than an adequate job for the rest of the system to really work at, at its optimum. So it's a very difficult decision I, you know, to do, but uh, I think ACC needs to have uh, control. Animal control is need really good people doing animal control. And I know it's different if it's a nonprofit doing it, not the government, but, you know, so that's a non-answer. <laughs> I'd like to just add one specific thing for that. Um, you you got to do a good job, and if you can't do a good job with the resources you have, shame on you for basically taking the money and letting the city off the hook. Right. If you can do the good job, uh, then and, and speak to a private. By the way, one of the rules of operating in San Francisco was if you can't brag about it on the six o'clock news, don't do it. Every employee had that directive. If you can't brag about what you did today on a six o'clock news, it's wrong. And I think a lot of animal control facilities have difficulty bragging about what they do. They have an explanation for what they do, but they can't brag about it. And so I think if you can meet the standard about bragging about whether it's animal control, humane society, SPC, I don't think it matters what you call yourself or how you get funded. Bottom line is brag about it on a six o'clock news. We have a question over here. Um, yeah, my question, I really love the idea that you're pitching this idea that we can move to a completely no kill shelter world. Uh, but I think my concern would be that you know there are uh, I, you're you're addressing pets as consumer products, which I think is a really valuable way to think about it. But no one wants to, to buy the old broken toy when they get the shiny new toy for the same price. Um, and I'm wondering how you address the idea of, of these older dogs or cats or sick dogs or cats. What do you do to, to make them adoptable? Um, and if you find that they aren't adoptable, is it you know a less of a tragedy to end that life or to keep it in, in a cage forever? You know? Well, actually, kittens are devil spawn, so I always. <laughs> Puppies are not far behind. <laughs> um, I think presented the right way, and these groups doing a good job, and Rich is the master of this, he can talk about it more, but there are no unadopted, I mean, it, what the provision that provided the exception he focused to all two injured for public health, everybody else is adoptable to the right family with the right marketing. Yeah. And, and it's reaching out. I mean, some diabetic dogs go well with diabetic people. Uh, some some people who are are single leg, uh, you know, go well with the with a tripod. Uh, but also in our movement, you know, we, we have 300 plus million people in the United States. Uh, one of the best ways of advertising some of the old and ugly and difficult to place for me was saying nobody wants this dog. This is a dog from hell. You, in your right mind, you should adopt this dog. I have ten people that jump out of their chairs. Okay, okay. And so you know, it's all about marketing. It's all about trying to find the connection. 
because yes, uh, the bulk of the, food, the, the field wants fast food. We want cheap and easy, and we don't want to have any, any consequences, ill consequences to our environment or to ourselves or to our, to our community. But the reality is you have to make tough choices. I don't think it is a good choice to end the life of any dog or cat that uh, it, it's not a kindness. We, in San Francisco, we don't kill homeless people because they have a rough life. We don't allow raccoons or, or uh, coyotes to be killed because they are uh, having trouble finding a meal at night. You know, the only time we had a raccoon problem in San Francisco was when it got in the mayor's garbage can. But the rest of the time, it was something you had to deal with. So I would submit to you that life is pretty precious. I don't know if there's a here, hereafter for dogs and cats. I, I think going to heaven and not having dogs and cats, it wouldn't be heaven. No. <laughs> uh, but, but I don't know if they believe that. So taking their life is all they got to have, and I don't think we should ever take it unless it's really a yeah. um, Would you agree then that we need one more facility to think about, and that would come in the form of a sanctuary? Where Here's, here's my concern. Uh, I've heard way too many stories about I'm from Houston, and our situation in Houston is horrible. Um, the number of strays, dogs and cats, roaming the streets is just huge. Um, and so there are a handful of rescues um, in Harris County, which is where Houston sits, who purport themselves to be no-kill. But the stories that I hear is that in some cases, people are coming in to adopt, and the rescue is so eager to get a dog placed that perhaps has been there for a long time, perhaps might fall into that somewhat unadoptable category. And uh, they have told people, if this doesn't work out, you can bring the animal back. Um, and so the person kind of takes this dog, and it really doesn't work out because it wasn't a good fit. And when they want to bring the dog back, the rescue says, not our problem. My concern is that uh, there are so many highly placeable dogs that the dogs that are more difficult to place <coughs> get swept aside. They're the dogs in the shelter that are on the high kill list. But if there were more sanctuary facilities that provided hospice care, as an example, um, that it might make the situation a little easier for everybody. I think if you build the right collaboration, you can, we are adopting, I mean, we're in the same place as um, Montreal in the sense that cats are a big problem because they're such effective reproduction units. But once again, <laughs> you build the um, you build the collaboration, you give people resources and services to be able to do better what they're already doing, you can save them all. You can and not the dangerous ones and not the sick or injured ones that we do not have the capacity to, to take care of right now. But and sanctuaries is a really there are some wonderful, wonderful sanctuaries. But unless they're properly resourced, these people get overwhelmed and it does not end up in a good situation. So I think the focus needs to be on build it to the point where you can save them. Um, I think, say, so there are some appropriate good sanctuaries, but I think that, that also is a really slippery slope with people, big hearts, not enough pockets, and they end up being hoarders. And we you know in some of the situations the ASPCA and the HSUS has had to go into. So. Thank you. Oh, there's two. There's two. Okay, go ahead. I was just wondering, um, do you undertake any um, breed-specific um, education efforts? I know in LA, I feel like all we see in shelters is pit bull mixes and chihuahua mixes. Yes, it's the dreaded exactly chihuahua. The same <laughs> I know. Paris Hilton should go straight to hell. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> in New York State, yeah, in New York State, we're very that we do not, it's, it's illegal to enact a breed ban. No municipality may enact a breed ban. 
Um, I believe that the Animal Farm Foundation, you know, four legs, two eyes, one heart, is a dog. Yes, there are issues around pit bulls sometimes, but it always goes back to the person, and it always goes back to the, um, you know, was it fixed or not, was it changed out. We have an anti-tethering law now in New York City, it's not as strong as I'd like, but we have one. So we, and ACC, yes, has many pit bulls, but they consider them just as adoptable as anybody else. Some of them can only go to the rescue groups who will then do behavior modification, um, but they adopt that pit bulls, there's no difference. Why well, isn't it more like a changing people's perceptions? Well, I mean, we leave that again, just the fact that we will adopt them out, we have pit bull groups specifically, we leave that up to like uh, the Buddy Project, and we leave it up to Animal Farm Foundation um, to do that kind of education with the public. But what we need is we need like um, a lab.